for joining us here this afternoon at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Brian Miller, I'm a non-resident fellow here. Um, we're gonna talk about automation and artificial intelligence in medicine today. I'm also a practicing doctor uh, working in the hospital and I can tell you I know exactly what it is like to work in a system where everything is manual. Uh, it's sort of like everything everywhere all at once. Uh, you're, it's like a 747 with manual controls and no autopilot flying around the world nonstop. So when I think about automation and, and AI, I think about its ability to transform medicine, be it you know, making sure that I don't have to type notes because it could be automated, uh, automating review of medical records to help approve services faster, augmenting clinicians, or even automating elements of clinical practice like pathology or dermatology to allow the physician to be more efficient. And so our industry has had flat labor productivity growth for over 25 years in the hospital sector. So I look forward to technology transforming this in a positive way and promoting mass-produced, mass-customized healthcare for patients. We have a great panel here today. Um, we have my colleague Jane Bombauer, uh, who's a professor at the University of Florida in the law school. She's an expert in free speech and First Amendment issues. Uh, we have my colleague Colin Rahm, who's the public policy lead for Andreessen Horowitz's uh, Biotech Venture Fund. He worked as a senior advisor for the former FDA commissioner, Stephen Hahn, uh, under the prior administration, and also worked for the Senate Health Committee. And then we have my good friend, Mark Leahy, who is a bundle of energy and creativity and is the CEO of the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. I'm also pleased in that um, we have some intro remarks from uh, Senator Blackburn of Tennessee from the Senate Finance Committee uh, on artificial intelligence and healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Miller and AEI for organizing this panel today. I wish I could be with you in person, but I'm not having to come to you virtually today. And I, I appreciate the topic as we're talking about AI in healthcare and the impact that this can have on so many different areas, disease analysis, remote surgeries, predictive diagnoses, uh, all will make a difference and yield better outcomes for our patients. Technology, what we have seen is healthcare technology over the last 15 years has made a tremendous impact on our citizens and has helped lead to some of those better outcomes. I have heard from so many providers and hospitals and device companies, innovators that are in Tennessee that they are always looking for new ways to use technology and to ask that all important question, what if we tried this? Or what if we did it a different way? And what they've learned is they can incorporate AI into their healthcare models and protocols and many times help get those better outcomes and do it in a reduced time frame, which of course we know is better for the, the patient. I know that you all are going to look at several topics today, the automation of administrative tasks so that providers are spending less time on compliance and more time working with the patient, talking to the patients. Also, you'll have a discussion about the ways that physicians can use AI to achieve those better outcomes and how programs like Medicare can support the integration of AI technology into cl clinical settings. In the Senate, we're exploring solutions to achieve these goals, uh, looking at CMS and some of their payment models, value-based care, access to telehealth, utilization, of telehealth and the regulation of AI in healthcare. Now, all of you are fully aware the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, or as we call it, MACRA, everything's got some 
uh, abbreviation, doesn't it? And MACRA was in 2015, and it really started that shift from fee-for-service to value-based care. The care model has improved outcomes. It has reduced cost. It has elevated patient care quality. And we have more work that we're needing to do as we look at alternative payment models and address reimbursement challenges, especially for our rural and underserved communities. And that is why I have joined a Senate Finance Committee working group that will explore and propose policy solutions for stable physician payments, things that are going to be predictable and consistent, and will propose necessary updates to MACRA, ensuring sustained access to quality for patients. How Medicare reimburses providers for AI utilization will be at the forefront of the conversation that my colleagues and I will have in the working group. And we would appreciate hearing from you because you're the ones with expertise on this issue. The integration of telehealth and virtual care has become instrumental in providing more accessible healthcare services, telehealth's ability to overcome geographical barriers and facilitate timely interventions has proven to be invaluable. I'm looking forward to hearing the insights on how we can leverage virtual care and remote patient monitoring technologies in every setting and discussing strategies in scaling these innovations, especially in AI. The growing emphasis on regulating emergency, emerging technologies requires careful consideration of AI's unique challenges and the opportunities. From diagnostic support to predictive analysis, AI holds significant potential in transforming patient care and operational efficiency. As we discuss, let's focus on how we can leverage AI for positive transformation while addressing ethical considerations, including privacy and data security. I encourage each of you to stay in touch with our office. You will find me at blackburn.senate.gov on social media. I'm at Marsha Blackburn. It's important that members of the Senate hear from you and realize the work that you are doing to solve some of these problems when it comes to payment models, when it comes to value-based care, and when it comes to better outcomes for your patients. Just a round of applause for her. Apologies that she could not join us in person. I'd, I'd like to start with intro remarks from each of our panelists, uh, starting with uh, Jane. Okay, so, so Brian introduced me as a free speech or First Amendment professor, and so you, you might be wondering what I'm doing on this panel. So I come as a useful, hopefully, outsider to the field, because uh, as a First Amendment specialist and also a torts professor, I think that's important too, that'll come up a bit. I tend to see the um, whole regulatory operation that's currently in place um, very differently. So on the First Amendment side, a lot of the, not all, but a lot of the AI applications that I think we're the most excited about are the sorts of things where an AI uh, tool t takes in and analyzes data and then spits out more information. So, you know, whether it's this decision support tool or a diagnostic tool or a treatment recommendation system, um, these are all uh, forms of speech. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not risky. Of course they are. There are risks presented with this type of uh, information. Uh, if a diagnosis is wrong is probably the most obvious example. Um, but the harms come from the you know, expected reaction of a listener. And so that means we're still in the domain that free speech law has been t tackling uh, from, from the beginning of the modern First Amendment era. 
And, and what that means is that regulation of, of pure speech products, which is what I think many of these tools are gonna be, has to be well tailored to real world and non-speculative risks and should probably follow some rules of thumb that have been developed in case law, both inside and outside um, the First Amendment and health law kind of interface. And then really quickly, I'll say as a torts professor, I also see um, the direction that the conversation has been moving in AI regulation is, is somewhat, um, if not troubling, at least kind of um, uh, unusual compared to how we act, manage risk in most other sectors. So, so um, when, if you think about other products like cars or activities like running a railroad or something, all of these things of course involve both innovation and risk and the system in the United States has historically been for ex post and fault based liability rules. So what I mean by that is nobody says in advance whether you can or cannot do something, but if you do do something and you took on a risk where you know, it was totally foreseeable that there'd be a risk that could have been reduced through some cost effective precaution, then and only then will you actually have to, um, to pay, change your, change your product or whatnot. Um, drugs have always been a special case because of the inherent, inherent uncertainty of not only among the consumers or doctors, but even the producers themselves about what types of risks are going to emerge and what, whether the benefits are as good as we hope they will be. And, um, and so I think the, the tendency has been to slot AI into a drug-like model or you know, devices sort of also follow um, the drug-like model um, out of sort of an abundance of caution and an and, and understanding that we don't quite know what the risks are. Um, but you know, there are serious opportunity costs to moving, to, to treating AI under this kind of precautionary um, approach. Uh, whereas a more open system where new entrants can, uh, you know, first of all, work out for themselves that they're not at too much liability risk, do their own testing, but then go ahead and, and, and roll out and try, uh, try their uh, products uh, out in, in the real market, uh, rather than having to wait in a very long line for preclearance. Uh, I, I think you know, the benefits of that approach are going to be significant and the risks can be managed. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, so th thank you, and, and two sort of comments in response to that. One is, I did watch, we talked about non-speculative risks, I did watch Terminator in preparation for this panel. <laughs> and then uh, my convertible, which I drove here, did go through preclearance, obviously, all components did. Um, before it was on the market. Yeah, it was pre-clearance reviewed by a regulatory agency before it all ended up on the market in 1999. Colin? <laughs> hey, thanks, Brian. I'm Colin Rahm. I'm head of public policy at Andreessen Horowitz, a uh, Silicon Valley-based venture capital firm focused on technology and its integration across every sector from financial services, pure tech, consumer tech, business to business. And um, our most recent, we have crypto, and then we also have American Dynamism, which is focused on technology integration into American preparedness. And then I'm here to represent our life sciences and biotechnology practice. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been focusing on, and um, it has been really central to our interest in playing a role, or at least having a voice or opinion here in DC, is um, artificial intelligence has been central to the investment thesis in our life sciences and healthcare practice since 2013. Um, our practice was founded by Vijay Pandey, who was the lone computational data sciences and biology. Um, he ran the lone computational and data sciences biology lab out of Stanford um, in the mid 2000s and then has started, started to see that integration long term. So I think okay. as we're seeing all this new interest or what seems to be new interest from Congress and regulators around how to regulate this new technology and its integration, we've largely had the opinion that this is not new and largely you're just seeing this new kind of interest because people haven't been familiarized with its impact and how it's already being deployed today. So I think one of the things that we're focused on and are, are very much trying to get involved in is to help regulators and lawmakers understand what the promise is, what this represents to patients, what it can represent to the cost curve in the healthcare system today, and how deployment of these technologies are gonna help basically create a system where caring for patients becomes m more human and allows for patients to get direct care from their providers and allow for technology to provide more personalized care. So excited for the conversation and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for joining. And it's, I, I would say it's 
replacement of components of clinical staff to allow them to then do other things like the average, if a, a primary care physician did all the tasks they were supposed to, they do the study every couple of years showing what their day would look like, and so the average primary care doc would have a 27-hour workday. And so my answer to that is, thank God for technology. <laughs> Mark? Uh, Brian, thanks. Good to be with you uh, and all of you as well. Mark Leahy, I've had the pleasure of running the Medical Device Manufacturers Association for over 20 years. We represent about 300. Um, start off primarily small, mid-sized, venture-backed companies, but we do work with some of the larger companies, and our mission is to provide timely access to safe and effective products for patients. Um, Colin, you were saying that you've been involved, you know, your firm's been involved in investing in the thesis in AI for the last 10 plus years. And I think it's important to level set here for medical devices. CDRH authorized the first uh, medical device with AI back in 1995. So this is not a new story in devices as well. And in fact, today there are over 700 uh, medical technologies that the FDA has authorized with an AI component to it or uh, software as a medical device. The software in a medical device too, so there's some nuances there. But I think, you know, we share, uh, you know, we've seen the, the impact it's had uh, for diagnostics, for monitoring, a uh, great opportunity. I think our overarching um, kind of lens here is, is do no harm. We, you know, we, we've had a good, not perfect at the FDA, but we'll get into some of the specifics where it's kind of worked well. There are a lot of other federal agencies now who are interested in the government about AI. And, and I think uh, kind of as a core tenant here, we don't want to see things that are layered on top that would run in conflict or could slow that patient access to these products. And I think it's also important to take a risk-based approach. You know, that's what CDRH does. You, you benefit, the, it's not the theoretical risks, it's the probable benefits outweigh the probable risks and keep that as kind of the, the, the focus. And, and again, I think to FDA's credit, there's some tools in, in Congress as well that they've tried to move forward to provide some flexibilities, but certainly more is needed. And on the, the overall value perspective, I think that's the other piece where it's, it's one, one component is to have that well-worn or clarity on the regulatory pathway, but if these technologies aren't valued appropriately in the healthcare system, uh, that's going to impact investment and adoption. So uh, a lot to chew on here, uh, but great, great potential, and not even potential, great impact today, but certainly more on the horizon, and happy to be here. Thank you. And Jane, a question for you. You've argued that many AI applications that we have are, or the development of those products is a form of free speech, and that the government might be constraining or regulating free speech by regulating that software. How do you think that free speech law is going to intersect with the regulation of medical AI at the FDA? Yeah, so I, I set up some of this in my intro remarks, which probably ran a little long, but, but maybe it would um, help to explain how I came to be talking about health technology at all, which was, my experience came through a, a few a few really salient examples. One was 23andMe, where I had all, as a, as a consumer, I had already done my kit, <laughs> and, um, and 23andMe was, was in the process of, of providing feedback on uh, genome-wide association studies. So they were basically just linking my, uh, you know, genome to, um, genome sequencing to um, known GWASs, and then, and then providing feedback, and that, of course, um, Got interrupted by FDA by an FDA letter, and and um, and since then, uh, 23andMe has been going through the clearance process, and so that got me thinking. Well, this this is strange because information already exists, you know, it, in two places, and then by connecting the two sources of information and telling me what I could learn about myself, that made an other otherwise you know consumer product turn into a medical device. And so, um, so it, it, it's uh, interesting, I think, that the gateway into becoming a drug or a device has to do with, first of all, how you market it. So that in itself is a kind of a very speech salient um, uh, uh, point of time. And then also that uh, any device that attempts to give um, actual you know, diagnostic information um, well, and then it needs to be giving it diagnostic information or some sort of medical information. So then, then another example came in the form of a um, mole doctor, a mole detector. I'm forgetting what the name now. It was an app, though, that was um, not as good at, um, at detecting carcinoma as, um, as, um, as, a, as a dermatologist, but better than a, a primary care physician. 
So, um, so uh, but the FTC, uh, FTC, not the FDA, um, uh, went after the app uh, for marketing itself as, as something that's uh, useful for uh, the purpose of, of diagno self-diagnosing your, your moles uh, because uh, it had not, you know, it, it, it was insufficiently substantiated. And this too seemed to me to be very strange, again, from a First Amendment perspective, that the risks actually seem quite low because we'd think that the proper comparison is to somebody who maybe goes to a primary care physician, maybe doesn't go to any physician at all, right? So compare the outcomes to that patient to, um, uh, to what life is like, um, you know, the distribution of outcomes for, for someone who has access to the, to the app. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, the, the third example though it is Google. So everyone Googles their symptoms to try to figure, get a diagnosis. And the only reason that Google isn't a medical device, or at least the Google search bar, I should say, isn't a medical device is because it doesn't market itself as it. It knows, of course it knows that people are Googling their symptoms. It even keeps track of flu trends and whatnot. Um, but everything about the, regula you know, the regulatory apparatus only applies once uh, there's marketing. So I see speech in two dimensions here. One is that the output itself is not a physical force. Uh, by the way, I, I do want to, uh, you know, contrast that with some AI that might be actually, you know, making decisions and then doing some sort of physical, you know, controlling a laser or, or physically sending an electric pulse or something. Those, I think, could safely be understood as, as non-speech products or a speech and, you know, speech and conduct um, or something. But, but for, for information output apps, it seems really obvious to me that there is First Amendment coverage, and the FDA, you know, the, the, the FDA has, has gotten into First Amendment trouble before, um, many times, um, uh, may, and, uh, and I think it will happen again if, if, if um, they don't recognize the First Amendment limits on this area. So it sounds like FDA is attempting to expand its authority from your perspective. I guess the question is, is how would we reconcile this with the current FDA device regulatory framework as applied to software and its risk-based, um, the risk-based regulatory framework that CDRH uses for devices. Mark, Colin, I, I didn't know if you had any thoughts along those yeah. lines. Right, I mean, there, there is a, you know, this is an area where people have been trying to grapple with what um, the software that's used in monitoring that's just kind of a wellness play, which is just kind of informing the patient versus something that's needs to have greater accuracy for um, you know, determining diagnosis or, 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 or pathway forward. You know, I, I think with all due respect to simply say, all right, it's a First Amendment, I mean, diagnostic, you know, the accuracy matters here. And I think you know, we certainly wouldn't want to say, all right, nothing gets looked at because it's all speech that's out there, it's reformulating it. Because if something's not accurate, then we certainly don't want people to rely on that. Um, for the purposes of clinical decision making. If it's, you know, it, how many steps they're taking or other things and it's truly just for the, so I, I think there's, there has been a lot of effort to try to draw that, that line and I think on the, the far ends it's easy to ascertain, all right, this is in scope, this is out of scope. There are some areas in, in the middle. Um, you know, I think when it comes to physicians and others, clearly around staffing and OR throughput, there's a ton of administrative efficiencies that can be leveraged here that should fall way outside of, of uh, FDA's purview here. I think there's a huge opportunity to drive costs out of the system through technology. I think when you migrate into the, you know, the, the more the devices that go into diagnosing, the monitoring, I think most, you know, folks would want to ensure that they're safe and effective with the right regulatory touch, not adding time so that it, it, it gums things up and, and patients are being let, delayed access. So it's just that, that nuanced approach. So, you know, something like automated surgery would obviously be a, a very high risk device. Thinking about the, the movie Prometheus, for example, with the automated surgical bay that does the CT scan and then operates on you. You know, that's probably 25 years away, but that's clearly a high risk device right now. It might not be high risk in 25 years. Do you think that part of the problem is in looking at what is a class one versus a class two device in the software and particularly AI context. And in answering that question, if you could provide some context for the audience about what those two categories mean and maybe the FDA's regulatory framework. Sure. 
Um, so again, there's a, a risk classification. The FDA has class three is the, the higher risk, class one is the lower risk, class two is kind of that middle and most fall in, between, in, in that class two uh, area. And there's you know, varying levels. There are certain class one exempt products where they're, you, know, you have to register with the FDA, you have to have a quality system in place, but it doesn't require you to actually file a submission before you can bring those products to the market. On the class three, you know, in class two, you do have to go to FDA and, and file that submission. That could be kind of middle ground for some of these technologies as well, where you, you want to kind of have visibility as to who's doing this, so registration, listing. You want to make sure they have a quality system in place, um, and so, you know, aligning around those. But if they're not kind of higher risk than a lighter regulatory touch, um, you know, there are tools in the toolbox. So I think it really comes down to less about we need a whole new structure for this than how do we leverage the current tools in the most effective way. And again, we'll get into the predetermined uh, change control plans in a, in a bit. But then on top of that, are there targeted changes that candidly FDA was utilizing in onesies and twosies, but felt if they wanted to adopt it more broadly, needed the congressional authorization to do so. So, you know, there is a, long story short, there is a risk-based approach to how medical devices uh, get through. It's supposed to be a least burdensome process as well, and so I think it's certainly appropriate if there are folks out there who are suggesting that, listen, yes, we are a medical device, but it's on the lower end of the spectrum here. Maybe uh, it could be characterized as kind of a class one exempt based upon the claims and other kind of features of the, of the technology. Yeah, and I think also that stamp of approval from FDA, when you look at the startup community too, gives them an easier path to market, right? And, and you have that stamp that allows providers, physicians, and folks across the entire provider group sector to be able to comfortably feel like we can use this and it prevents that more difficult sales pitch into some of the different provider groups and hospital systems that may be less likely or a little bit more skeptical of the technology. So I think a lot of times, effectively navigating that risk evaluation or mitigation strategy oftentimes allows technologies like the ones in our portfolio to more um, quickly navigate the market the market so share. One of the things that Mark mentioned, which I want to ask you about, was about conflicting regulatory uh, structures across agencies, and that we don't want to have agencies pile on top of each other so that technology innovators have to go through like three or four different agencies to get to market and then get payment and then finally, like it ends up in the hands of the consumer, the doctor, or the hospital, or you know, the health plan, or whomever. What do you think about sort of the recent ONC rules around AI? And do you think that those are producing sort of conflict with the FDA? Are these agencies sort of fighting each other for regulatory jurisdiction? I know that there's been a lot of talk about assurance labs. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so assurance labs have largely been the biggest issue um, over the last year or, year or so that we've been tracking really heavily. Um, I think the idea of leveraging third-party expertise is a huge opportunity for regulators and um, you know the companies that are innovating in this space to basically move through the process more efficiently, make it faster, and not have to go through the entire process of basically recruiting new folks at FDA and new areas of expertise and what comes with the user fee process when it comes to that. But um, you know, we're very supportive of the broader idea of, of Assurance Labs. The concern that we have is the broader um, proposal, an organization that has been getting a lot of um, support from regulators at the White House, from ONC, FDA, CMS, um, would largely put a handful of legacy tech companies coupled with a handful of large hospital systems in control of validating the safety, efficacy, risk mitigation, and um, bias alleviation of innovators or startups like the ones that we invest in every day. And I think um, this largely constitutes something that could potentially be a significant conflict of interest in terms of what that process looks like. You know, we don't ask companies that are innovating in the aerospace sector to send their technology to Airbus or to Boeing to create a to create an appropriate line or level of safety to enter the market. So we've been tracking this really closely, working with regulators to share our concerns about what this would do in terms of creating a market um, or a, a go-to-market process that could be potentially um, that could be potentially anti-competitive. We've we've shared that you know in the event that you end up getting to a, a system like this you're gonna end up seeing capital from firms like ours flow directly away from these technologies because of the regulatory process. And who's hurt most by that is patients, the health system and providers. So we've worked with them. It seems to sometimes um, 
fall on deaf ears a little bit, but I think the opportunity really here around Assurance Labs is a, a maybe a different system or a different model that is providing the tools necessary for different hospitals and hospital systems to validate against best practices and allow for them to start to integrate that themselves versus having a more centralized organization that's making those decisions that's made up of the same organizations that have AI incubator programs that are hoping to develop and commercialize in the same market as the companies that they're reviewing. So uh, your thought would be having a choice of assurance lab models sure. and then also having some decentralization so that hospitals can work as labs to test the technology, yeah, I mean, to continue to test and innovate on the technology that they are then integrating into their operations. Exactly, I mean eventually you would want a system where every hospital is, a, is, a, is essentially an assurance lab with the tools required and an understanding of the best practices of how to integrate this technology into their system and validate it against their own localized, their own localized um, patient data to allow for them to understand and make decisions around what's best for them and their patient population. So two questions. One, first, Mark, in conjunction with thinking about assurance labs and decentralization, what are the other things you think that the FDA should do to promote sort of the growth of AI? And how do they need to adapt their regulatory framework? I know that the FDA for many years, longer than I've been in Washington, has talked about voluntary alternative pathways, performance-based regulation. What do you think that the FDA should be doing to increase the efficiency of review, make the review more tailored to the you know, innovator at hand, and then get those products into the hands of patients and doctors. Sure, well, I, again, I, I'll give the, the FDA credit that they have been working on this for, for quite some time. As I noted earlier, just in 2022, Congress in a bipartisan fashion passed Fedora, it's a number of FDA amendments, and part of that uh, I think it's Section 515C, uh, amendment to the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, uh, provided the proposed change protocol plan that effectively, you know, historically, you would bring your product to the FDA, they would review that to ensure it's safe and effective and you'd get your market authorization. Uh, and if you wanted to make changes to that that were significant, um, that was a, a, an additive process and you had to have another filing. I think there's a recognition particularly around software as a medical device that there are known changes that you're gonna need to make um, at the time of your initial submission. And so through this legislation, co Congress authorized companies to come to the table with additional changes that they anticipated to make. Uh, and again, there was an analysis of the quality system in place, the reasonings for those changes couldn't change the indications for use and intended use, but provided, you know, as long as you stay within a certain kind of lane, those changes could be made without having to go back to the FDA. And so that has, and it's again, early stages, I think they tried to, they've done it a couple times previously in the DeNovo in 2020, um, but they put out a draft guidance, we filed comments, um, Congress has given them the latitude, and candidly, this is not just an AI and machine learning, I think this is, the, the P P PCCP should be used broadly, but here it certainly lends itself to more flexibilities for these types of technologies that maybe don't work within the traditional regulatory framework. Uh, you know, a couple years back, maybe five years back, they were exploring this pre-cert program too, again, with recognizing that technology evolves quickly in software. Um, could you have a, a pathway here that again, with companies who have a, a good quality system and proper guardrails, additional changes to be made more quickly? Uh, ultimately, um, I think it was Senator Warren, um, Senator Murray basically sent a letter to FDA that their pilot uh, needed to stop because they didn't have the authorities to, to go beyond that. Uh, and shift, in, relate, different but related, I know on the LDT side, you know, there's been discussion of a kind of a lighter touch, uh, efficient uh, review process for LDTs that maybe could be crosswalked here. So those are areas where I think we'll give them some credit. I think, as Colin said, though, too, this is not something, that if we continue to see the growth, and we've seen significant growth for these AI-enabled devices since 2018, um, and if we expect to see that growth, which I think we do, uh, leveraging third-party reviewers, I think, is a, a great opportunity here. I, I'd agree. We, having groups come together to deliver, to develop standards and clinical specifications makes great sense. I don't, I, I don't think it makes sense for competitors to be able to dictate whether you you know, you're yay or nay, but, but having those groups to come together and then having third parties who can, you know, have the capability to 
follow those specs and to validate companies are doing it. That's you know how, broadly speaking, regulations work in, in the EU for medical devices. FDA has the authority to use third-party reviews here in the United States, but Congress kind of put uh, some really tight screens on that that has limited its, its applicability, but I think this is a great area where that would uh, certainly benefit um, the patient and benefit the ecosystem as well. Uh, and not having to resubmit your application for version 5.3, version 5.3.1, and version 5.3.2 probably makes sense for both the uh, innovator <laughs> technology company and also like the FDA reviewer is gonna be bored looking at that just from a pragmatic perspective. And the FDA doesn't have enough staff, right? You can, you can only hire so many orthopedic surgeons, so many PhD biomedical engineers, whether telework, in-person work, you know, partially remote work. The FDA is not going to be able to get enough staff to review all of the software that's going to be classified as a medical device. Yeah, I mean, we should and be so, hoping for an avalanche, right? This is, we, we hope mean, that they will be overwhelmed, avalanche. right, yeah. So, <laughs> a, a, a couple questions, one, you know, I, I see from my physician and colleagues that there's a, a lot of anxiety about tech. Now, I uh, you know, grew up out west, so for me, technology and disruption is sort of normal, like I'm used to it as a kid. I remember getting phone directions, then I remember MapQuest, and you print out the directions, and then I remember you had touch screen navigation in cars was a big deal, and then you got Google Maps, and now Google Maps plugs into your car because you don't even need the navigation in your car. So like for me, these transformations in all parts of life, be it from how I get around town to email to calendars to address books is normal. But in the medical profession, it's really scary for a lot of physicians. And liability is one of the biggest questions. So my question for you, Jane, is where do you think that this intersects with medical liability? And do you think that FDA an FDA review of some of the higher risk products in particular serves as a liability shield for physicians. Yeah, okay, so, so for physicians who are using um, an AI tool, I think the basic principles of medical malpractice are still the right ones, or, um, but, but these new tools might introduce some, some kind of um, tricky line drawing exercises. So, so in general, a doctor just needs to comply with a, a broad sense of what is acceptable in their field. It's a sort of custom standard, um, and that makes a lot of sense, I think. And so I think over time, there will be, you know, you, you will go from, you will see some cases where a doctor used a tool that was clearly not ready and they should have known it, or may, maybe it wasn't even FDA cleared or something like that they might be held liable. But over time, I think you'll see cases where a doctor failed to use an AI tool. And, um, and, and so the, the basic question, though, seems to me to still stay the same, which is whether they were engaged in reasonable care as, as compared to, to their professional you, colleagues. You said something actually really interesting there, which is that the standard may be that the doctor didn't use the tool or use the tool it, it, inappropriately. Yeah, I mean, in fact, you've seen that you, there, there, are some, there are some cases where a doctor can actually be held liable for not prescribing off-label a prescription. So the standard for doctor care is not necessarily the same as the standard for FDA. Um, uh, the standard is simply whether the doctor failed to be within either the majority or a significant minority of doctors um, who would think that this is an appropriate you know, and okay, one of the appropriate ways to go. I think that, can, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you can look at, as part of that conversation though that we're having now, that technology is here today, and there are situations today where it could constitute malpractice for not integrating some of these AI-based technologies like mammographies or colonoscopies where they have the ability to sense or detect possible polyps that are, are not detectable to the human eye and can also long-term save money for having to go back and do a subsequent or additional colonoscopy. So I think we're seeing that a lot today. And to your point a little bit, Brian, um, culturally, one of the things that we found really interesting about this is um, you would assume some of the more high tech or more advanced hospitals and hospital systems are the ones that are first to integrate this technology. And what we're actually seeing is um, kind of cold outreach from some of the more rural patient populations and provider groups 
asking us what's here today, what can we do to help facilitate better care and better technology to make sure that our, our organizations are gonna be capable of, of taking care of the patient populations as we have a huge dearth of provider group or providers in our area or in our network. Right, because yeah. Sorry, just to add, I, I'd say mm -hmm. the main question is whether the reliance on a tool was either reasonable or whether non-reliance on a tool was un unreasonable. And the, the same should actually apply to direct to patient or direct to you know, consumer, whatever you want to call it, um, sorts of um, applications as well, that in some cases uh, we might want responsibility, you know, so between the three, the patient, the doctor, and the producer, um, shifting responsibility and liability will depend to some extent on whether in the particular context in which the tool was used, it was you know, erroneous for the user to, to rely on it, erroneous for the doctor, or if their reliance made sense, then maybe then that's when the liability needs to shift to their company. Yeah. So it's interesting we talk about tech changing the standard of care. So in the ICU, if you're on like pressors to keep your blood pressure up because you're critically ill, they have to place a central line, right? And because it's a continuous infusion, it has to be delivered centrally. And that's, that's risky because central lines go in places where there are big veins, where there are other important arteries and nerves and things. So like you have to get it in the right spot. If you accidentally cannulate someone's artery, that's really bad. And they have to go to the operating room with the vascular surgeon emergently. So as you can imagine, this is high risk. And you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they didn't have ultrasound to do that. And now the standard of care is ultrasound, and so if someone tried to do that without ultrasound, you would run screaming into the room asking them what they're doing. Right. Because the standard of care is you have to use ultrasound, not using ultrasound is negligence. And I think a lot of these tech tools will eventually get to the point where they're so integrated with care. And Colin, you mentioned rural hospitals. If you have a staffing shortage, you have travel nurses, you can't afford travel nurses, you have part-time doctors, you have temporary doctors, you have a budget crunch, you have a population that travels two hours in a blizzard in the middle of the winter to see you. Like, you have a limited resource environment and the most cash-strapped environments are the ones that are going to have to be created. And so they're going to be looking for technology to be that additional adjunct or accelerator of the doctor, nurse, pharmacist, or whomever is actually there or is going to be there. And so when we think about adoption, right, the financial stress that rural delivery systems experience will actually make them probably some of the most advanced delivery systems. But the question is, what is the, pro what, what is the barrier that you see in the Medicare program and in reimbursement for AI and automation? Well, I think we're seeing two things. One is just the general gray area from the regulatory perspective. We don't know what it's gonna look like in terms of long-term reimbursability. There's a, there's a little bit of difficulty from kind of a cultural perspective to your point earlier of like, physicians aren't sure whether this is the right next step or whether this, in, this technology can be integrated because we don't know what the future regulatory structure is gonna look like and how that will basically impact practice. So one of the things that we've been working with regulators on is kind of what does the future look like? How do you reimburse for care that's either you know, delivered or rendered directly by um, an AI service or model? Or then what are the next, uh, you know, what are the downstream impacts? And I think one of the things that we're seeing is that to your point, and we had a meeting with um, some of your folks on your team about four or five months ago where they were talking about what are, what are the ways that we can leverage technology to have that be the initial entry point into the healthcare system. And I think, um, you know, it's not just Medicaid where we're seeing a lot of this too. It's, it's uh, a lot of difficulty when it comes to tech companies and startups trying to help better integrate into the Medicaid program and thinking about what that impact could do to ensure broad access to this technology and also have a better cost effective care, care model for these patients that are largely underserved and aren't having better outcomes over time. So a question that I was just thinking about uh, earlier today after I had a lot of caffeine, uh, is, you know, like in the, the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, whatever the payer is, there's a conception that it is a person providing the service. And everyone is always trying to become the person providing the service. <laughs> there's always another professional that's trying to become the person providing the service, right? I mean, first was doctors, then we had nurse practitioners, and, you know, all kinds of other healthcare professionals want to be billing healthcare programs. 
But technology is different because it can do so with more efficiency, potentially, in some settings, not all settings, but in some settings, maybe higher quality, definitely, potentially, better safety performance in some settings, too. And so I guess my question is, from a service perspective, right, like if you're an innovative technology company, do you think that an innovative technology company, and this is a question for all of you, uh, should be able to bill a payer for just delivering a routine medical service? So if I have a urinary tract infection, and, or I have pneumonia, or I have high blood pressure, and I can have software diagnose and in theory prescribe, I mean, I realize there are state law issues there, but let's say it could, or titrate my blood pressure medications. Do you think that the technology should be able to bill for that service? So, <laughs> so we all turn and look I, at the, the reason, yeah, the, <laughs> the reason I, I, I hesitate to say one way or the other is on, on one hand, yes, of course we want, um, you know, good enough treatment, uh -huh. uh, maybe even, you know, maybe even treatment that would, is as good, you know, as good or better than, than the treatment we have today with, with um, in a, in a human-run clinic. Um, of course, we want that to be able to be offered directly to patients, um, including those on Medicaid without whatever cost burden there is. The reason I hesitate, though, is that, you know, Medicaid and Medicare pr programs, uh, you know, the, the, the secondary payer just sort of masks a lot of the costs and, I still see, perhaps more than my colleagues here, mm -hmm. I, I see some potential for a direct-to-consumer, not patient, but I'm consumer a fan market. Direct-to-consumer, also. What was that? I'm also a fan uh, of yeah, direct-to-consumer. Well, well, okay, and so right, if we um, think about, like, because in health policy, we always talk about paying for value and, you know, like that, benefiting patients. But if we really want value and we really actually want to benefit the patients, right? You need appropriate competition between technology, technology, assisted human service, and pure human service, because you know we have a shortage of, what is it, 100,000 doctors, 90,000 nurses, we don't have enough CNAs, we don't have enough patient care techs in the hospital, we don't have enough telemetry techs, we don't have yeah. enough pharmacists, like yeah, the list so, goes on. Right, So, and there's very little risk that these, that, that like AI is gonna take over all, all of absolutely. these jobs. I, 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 and right. the, the law, legal profession is going through this too, and, and there will be a need for, uh, for, for clinics period, but there is a vast amount of unserved, you know, health needs, um, including by people who have insurance right, and, and, you know, pr privilege and who just don't have time or whatnot, that should be served by a direct-to-consumer market. And, for, you know. and a direct-to-consumer, or even whether direct-to-consumer through a payer, technology could massively expand access to care, high quality, safer care for the poor, for the middle class, because wealthy patients are always going to be able to afford to get access to care. It's the average American that we need to worry about that's or the, the working poor. Benefits the most. Right, right, that's the patient population who benefits from the most. So is there a way that we can promote paying for the value and efficiency of technology? Because at least my, my personal view, not the view of any of my affiliations, obviously, is, is that uh, we are not valuing technology and paying for that efficiency and democratizing access to care for the average American. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe to take a step back a little bit from this, but w there is also a concern from some of the innovator, innovator companies that largely, like, no one wants to be first to market with an AI doctor service, mm -hmm. right? That's going to bring on the most scrutiny, regardless of, you know, the interesting part that we have or the perspective that we have that may be a little bit different from the traditional voice in Washington is, right, we see technology every day that is a decade out from patients. And it provides a really unique and interesting perspective, but also it is a little bit scary or a little bit different to explain to someone on Capitol Hill or a regulator of what the idea of an AI co-pilot with every physician or provider looks like and what that potential impact could have for the lowest income patient populations. And that's the area that we look at the most of like, imagine a, a world or a system where every patient has access to not just a provider in their rural or underserved area, but in their pocket or with them at all times is the highest level, most capable, most advanced version of technology that can assist them throughout the whole process. And customized mm -hmm. to them personally. Yep. Yeah. And, and listen, I, I, agree. I think that's the, the holy grail here is if you're delivering objectively better outcomes with lower cost to deliver, yep. that's the opportunity. And with the labor force is what it is, then 
I'll just share that, you know, one example, recent memory, the last 10 years, you know, there's a medical device cleared that automated the delivery of anesthesia in the hospital setting. The anesthesiologist did not, it was safe and effective by FDA, but from a market adoption standpoint, it faced real challenges because it was displacing labor. And I think, you know, our members are looking right now to how does this help inform the physician and the delivery of care? You know, what you're talking about is downstream, we want to get there, and again, I think it's gonna depend upon what the technology and what the price point is. I mean, I have yeah. two high school daughters now, but when they were little, we had great health insurance, we had primary care docs, but we went to the medical clinic because I'd rather pay 60 bucks out of pocket, get those tests done, and, and so I think there are absolutely models that have worked in the, for the right you know, tests and others that the out of pocket's gonna be fine, but if, as you go up that kind of severity of sophistication, it's gonna be cost prohibitive probably to do that. And I think one of the things, you know, CMS has done this on onesies and twosies when there's been technologies kind of primarily AI based in, in medical devices where they have rewarded the value there with the new tech add-on payment. Um, but again, once that, that lasts for about three years and then you're kind of lumped into an existing uh, DRG usually. And so what can be done that properly incentivizes technologies that maybe not have the same labor intensity to it, but there's mm -hmm. significant investments on the technology side, on the data analysis side, on the computing side that accurately rewards that value in the marketplace. Because, you know, unless and until we kind of think, and again, this is not gonna be done tomorrow, but you know, having this conversation, I can tell you, we could get through the regulatory process, but if you don't have that value associated in the marketplace, none of your folks and none of the VCs are going to be putting money into it right. and therefore they'll all go the way of the dodo and we're back with the same healthcare system we have today. Right, and I, I think the thing that at least I've always thought about with technology and healthcare is, is that people don't realize that the current purely human-based manual system in many circumstances can be highly unsafe, right? Like patients don't see those bad events that happen. There are bad events that happen every day in hospitals across the US, and it's not because doctors are bad people or nurses are bad people or hospitals are bad companies. Like there are good clinicians, good staff, and good companies trying to do a good job. But when you have a thousand tasks that are manual, cognitive, procedural, process, just by chance alone, some of them are going to go wrong. And so if we can automate some of those tasks and decrease that cognitive burden to allow the staff to function at a higher level and be more efficient and effective and safe and safer, right? That will be better for patients. Like the average, you know, there was a study in JAMA and internal medicine a few years ago, and you're like, why is he citing academic literature that no one cares about? And they did a time motion study of internal medicine residents who spend a lot of time in the hospital, like 80 hours a week. Anyone guess what the percentage of time was spent on direct patient care? It was out of, at, at what percentage of time? 20. 13, <laughs> 13%. So if you're spending 13% of your time actually talking to patients who are hospitalized with serious illness, cancer, pneumonia, blood clots, alcohol withdrawal, whatever it is, that's by definition probably not customized and personalized. It's not because the doctors or hospitals are bad, it's just because the system is designed to make them do everything. So automation and AI and medicine has huge, enormous potential. And with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. This is a great conversation. I appreciate you all doing it. I'm Carl Polzer, and um, background, I, I work on a lot of issues now having to do with low-income workers, but my background relevant to this is I. For 10 years, I was the head of policy for a major assisted living association here in town. So a couple weeks ago, there was a front page article in the Post where AI used by three major assisted living companies was forced upon allegedly facilities and substandard care occurred and now they're, they're all in court, okay? So my question is, it has to do with can, you, can mach uh, a machine bill? I, I mean, all these machines are coded by people the codes are developed by people, the codes are authorized by people, and they're applied by people. So there's human interface at all phases. So in these, is there a whole like cottage industry being developed now when these cases go to court uh, in terms of documentation of how the AI was developed, applied, et cetera? Um, 
I just wondered about, and, and, and for the purposes of regulation, what kind of documentation should be required and accessible in, in regard to who did this? What is it? What is the, how does the machine work? Who's responsible? Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I guess I mean, that seems like more the administration of healthcare. So devi our devices are going through and they're getting authorized. And again, a lot of what we hear about AI is garbage in, garbage out. But again, we're you know closed system algorithms, you know, very tight screen. FDA is reviewing it. So I think from the device stamp, and this, this seems like a more of an administration. So I'd say this is probably outside the lens. Yeah, of and I, I mean, thinking putting on an administrative hat. If you think about it, so tools, processes, and people are put in place, there are systems that are put in place by people, uh, used by people, they have a process by which the people who are working in the facilities have to use that technology. If the people who put the process in place made a failure of judgment, uh, there was not enough autonomy in, uh, downstream in order to question the technology, or they were the technology itself was not appropriately designed, like any of those elements could have gone wrong. I can't speak to the specifics, but it emphasizes the fact that we still need humans. So even if we automate lots of processes, there's still a huge place, an important place in medicine, healthcare writ large for human judgment. We're all still going to be employed. We might be still doing slightly different tasks, um, but it sounds like that's a case where there may have been a, a management and process issue. Good question. question for, for Colin, but I can all weigh in. Um, Colin, I, I believe I've heard, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe I've heard your principal, Mark Andreessen, talk or advocate for an, an open source approach to AI. Yet the, the products that we're talking about here today, you know, life sciences, drugs, devices, diagnostics that you're clearly investing in, typically get developed in a very proprietary fashion, you know, exclusive licenses, um, you know, proprietary know-how, carefully drafted patent applications that don't lead your competition to, you know, the crown jewel of your technology. So, on its face, that seems like an inherent, unbridgeable gap. Yeah, sure. Talk, so talk about that a little bit. Sure. So, I think there's kind of two ways to look at it. I think the broader thought process that we're having around AI and its applications across sectors, not just in the healthcare space specifically, is that the, a lot of the conversations that are coming from regulators around, or not regulators, but rather some of the bigger tech companies, are everything should be closed source because the idea of access to these large models, it could get into the hands of the wrong people. These things might create a system where there's a, a different level of fairness or bias. And I think Mark's thought process around this is putting these things out in the open allow for organizations and different tech companies to be able to basically regulate and keep track of one another in a way that they would have certainly more expertise than any organization in the federal government will be capable of. Now, it, with regards to the applications in healthcare, it is a little bit different to your point, and I recognize exactly where you're coming from. I think the way we're thinking about it from an open source perspective is largely for the applications outside of the healthcare sector because of how they carry health data, HIPAA requirements, and things like that. So that's been, there. I totally understand kind of the difference, but I think with a lot of it, some of the conversations we've had with some of the big research institutes also apply, though, to open source in terms of, you know, there's technology that helps determine or look at different ways that proteins fold and how those could be applied to cellar gene therapies or even how you could think about how certain cellar gene therapies work directly with someone's personalized genome or what that looks like. So sometimes those models are actually shared between research institutes, and that's something that we're very much in favor of. But some of it is just like smaller applications versus these big, almost enormous LLMs that have access to the entire internet, for instance, and how they're trained. So it's dependent on the application largely. JP Hogan. Um, I'm trying to figure out whether this is more a drone question or a first response, but in hearing this, I'm wondering, are you at whether AI maybe could prescribe something that could be delivered by drone, but maybe it would be a limited like two or three day dose so that you then have time to get to a doctor. So you have the rural, so whether that would go into, uh, you get a couple days to get to a doctor, but you can get something by remote uh, drone or just wondering where some of that is falling, where the doctor would still be in the system, 
but you might be able to get something AI generated for a day or two, if um, just as a fallback. So I'm just wondering if are the discussions already there for remote deliveries and emergency? I can't speak to that. Uh, we haven't invested in anything um, in that space, but that's certainly something that um, is interesting that we can look into. I mean, I, I think there would be a scope of practice, like can the machine practice medicine? Um, I'm obviously not a state medical licensing board, uh, nor would I want that job. It sounds stressful. But uh, y you can imagine eventually it gets to the point where technology does have some scope of medical practice, a limited scope. Uh, the question, of course, then is where does technology and FDA regulation intersect with medical licensure for autonomous care? I don't think that that question has been answered by anybody. It's an important one, though, because you could imagine, not may, maybe not today, but sometime in the not so distant future, years down the road, that that scenario could actually happen, right? Because again, yeah. from a labor perspective, we're not going to be able to be training you know, several hundred thousand extra nurses, doctors, pharmacists, et cetera. So we have to think about ways to either augment and improve their efficiency, or have a bridge before people reach them or upskill the doctor, nurse, whomever, and then have technology augment the rest. So another question that I was wondering about, um, well, I, I got a couple text questions here. One is, okay, can, can the question is, is, can we ask to discuss medical data marketplaces as referenced by ARPA-H and the FDA Specifically, how should these be rationally implemented to preserve privacy and also encourage innovation? And are there other examples of non-medical but regulated data marketplaces that could be considered? So I'm not familiar with that particular um, I'm not portion of the law, yeah. but I can, I can speak a little more broadly about I, yeah, health I think, privacy. I think the question is, is about balancing health privacy and HIPAA with innovation yeah, and what okay. happens when your data gets decentralized and put into a, right. a, essentially the cloud or a study pile. Yes, yeah, so I, I, you know, so HIPAA, HIPAA was actually sort of my entree into writing about health, health law at all. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it served an important purpose when it was developed. Um, it, there was a gap in kind of confident, basic confidentiality norms among um, doctors and, and clinics that um, got you know sort of sol solved, or you know HIPAA sort of brought in a new culture of being careful about um, discussing your patients and just sharing data willy nilly. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I think it does more harm than good. So I I, I think the things that um, that HIPAA could learn from, um, you know, non non regulated or less regulated fields are first of all, um, uh, possibly reinterpreting what de-identified data means. So that you know, that if it's de-identified data, then it can be shared and used and, and exploited for for good purposes, research purposes, and whatnot. And that maybe needs to be moved more toward like a, a use or purposive test rather than a could a bad actor theoretically. Uh, figure out which patient this is, um, and then mix that, of course, with access and security requirements and whatnot. But um, um, and then um, and then likewise, I think the consent and control model of privacy um, will. I mean, especially if the de-identification problem isn't solved, the consent and control model is just going to be too cumbersome. It either means that um, data is highly siloed and not being used effectively for lots of competing startups to, to create really useful um, health technology, um, or, um, or it means that patients will be constantly bombarded with, with permissions. Um, and, and HIPAA has also been a, a shield for bad, you know, has been a, a ploy or a ruse <laughs> for for what's really actually sort of proprietary interests. So when we were talking about electronic health records, industries not being willing to, to make their uh, systems interoperable and, and citing HIPAA as a justification for that. Um, hospitals too can, um, might have the same issue. So 
so so I, I, I do think it's, it's time to, to uh, move to, again, a sort of use-based, purpose-based, risk-based <laughs> approach to privacy. Uh, so I have two questions here, one of which is probably for Colin and one of which is for Mark. Uh, Mark, we know that uh, EHR interoperability is a barrier to execution of AI-driven tools. To some degrees, hospitals really want to capture patients' data and technology rather than promoting competition, innovation, entrepreneurship. What do you think that policymakers can do to combat this problem? So, you know, it, it's interesting because the, the question was set uh, earlier about open source, et cetera. I mean, in, in the medical device space, a lot of our companies have worked to make their devices interoperable with one another. You know, the hospitals 10 plus years ago would show a picture of an ER with all the wires and saying, you all need to talk to each other because this is inefficient. So our companies may have made great strides to make sure devices talk with one another interoperable. But it was interesting, then you'd have that conversation with the hospital CEO saying, okay, well, we've done this to kind of meet your needs. Leveraging, leveraging big data has been a goal for many for, for a long time. What can we do to make sure that your EHRs talk, you know, are interoperable, that Cerner and Epic are even within one IDN and another? And it was kind of like crickets, because I think the, the reality is they don't want to see the patient be able to walk down the street and go to the competitor. And so, you know, I, I look back to, I think, what Secretary Azar and, uh, and um, Seema Verma said at a HIMSS meeting a few years back, basically, it's the patient's data. We're going to, you know, drive in that direction one way or the other. But for a variety of reasons, maybe HIPAA and others, I think there's a bipartisan interest to have EHRs be interoperable and leveraging that data in a useful way. Uh, but it hasn't got to the implementation phase yet. And I think, you know, there are certainly tools in the toolbox if folks want to compel uh, those final kind of locks to be unlocked for the greater good, but thus far, we haven't been able to get there. Yeah, and I think that's also one of, the, to your point, one of the areas where open source in healthcare can be a real driver of, the, of benefit for accessibility for patients and accessibility for their own health information. So t two other questions. One question, um, for Jane, um, stipulating that someone develops an AI urgent care doctor that could assess less skilled practitioners like nurse practitioners of physician assistants effectively, so essentially upskilling them into the full MD, uh, something like GitHub's co-pilot for an NP, what are the existing regulatory requirements that they'd have to cross to market the model? and is this the FDA and then, or is this something that falls just on the liability of the practitioner, right? Does it go to the software manufacturer or software developer in this case? And does it go to the, or does it go to the physician assistant or nurse practitioner? Or is that yeah, not, so is that to, uh, to be decided? I, I, I think it's a little bit indeterminate right now for the reasons that you were teeing up, that at least right now, if, if you go if, if you go to a clinical setting, you are being seen by either a doctor or a nurse practitioner, and in, in any way, someone authorized to practice medicine in the state. And, um, and so then their decision to use that software could be, um, you know, could be a, a, a source for, few, you know, liability or could, could be a hook for liability later if they're harmed. Um, the product, too, the, the producer could also be sued um, and would also presumably have to have already gone through FDA clearance. And so we're looking at potentially two layers of um, regulation where historically, you know, doctors were, doctors did not have to be regulated by the FDA and, 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 and vice versa in terms of um, drugs and devices. Uh, I, of the two systems, um, for reasons that I've probably already kind of um, made clear or telegraphed, I, I think the doctor approach or the state common law approach has actually honed more to risk, you know, the, the risk method and the, you know, the, the sort of, you know, ex post liability method that I, that I tend to prefer. Um, but it's not clear at all yet how, I mean, and especially once you take away the doctor, that the scenario you were asking about where you have an in-home you know, MD AI app or something, That's that, then we're really in unknown, uncharted territory. So the, the follow-up question I think would be for Colin, which is, does that technology company need to run a study 
showing that this model, the nurse practitioner, physician assistant, plus the co-pilot, uh, effectively matches the answer of a panel of expert docs presented with the same circumstances, or is sort of the evidentiary burden not clear right now? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've heard from a lot of both developers and then also regulators at the state and federal level is what does the actual licensure or approval process look like? And especially if there's an idea of, like there's a current regulatory structure, but in the event that there are technologies that can basically pass a licensure board, for instance, in every state, what does that look like? I, right? I think and it I think, already could pass the license, the USMLA. Yeah, and so there's there are a handful of, um, of JAMA articles that came out at the beginning, or end of last year, beginning of this year, that were basically saying like, here's what's happening. And these are models not specifically trained on data sets mm -hmm. specific to healthcare and care delivery. So I don't think I have, we haven't figured out what the answer to that question is um, until someone else goes to market first and deals with all these, these different regulatory loopholes and hurdles and things like that, there's gonna be um, somewhat of a disincentive to be the first to market there. I was gonna say, thank God ChatGPT4 wasn't around when I had to take a USMLE and then apply for residency. <laughs> I would have been outscored. Um, so one final question, uh, sort of about FDA review. What do you think that we can do to use AI to increase the efficiency and speed of FDA review, or is this a pipe dream? Uh, I mean, personally, I think one of the things that comes to mind is basically creating uniformity in each of the medical product submissions. And I think that's been one of the things that Janet Woodcock has mentioned, right? Companies can submit their own different, um, basically their application clinical data submission. And I think creating some level of standard across each medical product center and then being able to have something that can quickly do an initial baseline review mm -hmm. that flags different data sets or different pieces of data that could be more interesting or require secondary or third or fourth level reviews from reviewers could create just a faster process through which there's no, there's no sacrificing safety and efficacy, but rather flagging some of those more outstanding data points that could be helpful for reviewers. Or having some of the initial analysis be teed up automatically mm -hmm. For the reviewers, the farm talks team, the stat team, right. the medical officer who's doing the review, and then have them be able to do secondary analysis on yeah. top of that. I, I would say too, again, quality in, quality out, how this is being analyzed, making sure that you know you certainly wouldn't want to lose the human element here. I'm not suggesting you, because you could see the flip side of this would be, okay, it goes to AI, you've got a, a negative response, and no person to go to, and no reasoning behind it other than no, you know, just, you know, think of a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs down without uh, maybe a nuanced review or without any information. So I, I, I think the ability to leverage technology to drive the administrative process with an FDA mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. And assuming we move down the road to have some of this help with the clinical and the statistics and biocompatibility, I think you know, as long as it's quality, it's, it's gonna be helpful, because you said there is human error, but I, I, I know that, you know, the, the watch out has been, okay, you know, in some instances, you still wanna make sure there's a level of accountability to individuals, and they can't just say, well, this is what the system says, so our hands are clean and you're stuck. Right, so more of an augmentation as opposed to an automation of review, so augmenting. For now, although for now. again, at some point, the humans, I mean, this is what happened with chess, right? At some point, introducing oh, the human review is going to introduce more yeah, error and, than, and, yeah. And, and that's the natural evolution, and someone said, yeah. you know, whether it's <laughs> drones, I mean, it's, at some point, if this all works as we intended, you would drop a box <laughs> in a third world country, and someone walks in, and they're getting diagnosed, and I mean, that's, yeah. It, and maybe to someone remotely, but it's, it's, and that's 30 plus years down the road, but that's, there's a great opportunity here, but you tell me in the here and now, and yeah, some right. of the, you yes, know, that, totally. that where FDA that. is going and leveraging AI, I would not want to, to say, well, our model said that you're a no-go, and that's yeah. the end of the discussion. Yeah. So maybe something like assessing application completeness, for example. Right. Well, you're seeing this, our, you're seeing actually in, in the device space with the, the E-Star, you know, and, and to Colin's point, it's, it's, this is helpful for both industry and FDA, uh, FDA, the reviewers, where it's a structured submission. Here's what's in, here's what's in. There's links to the guidance document, so, and it allows you to be searchable. So there are already a lot of automated or functions here that are, that are digitizing this that makes it more efficient, and optimizing that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and again, down the roll, could there be some decision support for the reviewers? Sure, I just, I think we wanna make sure we take a, a prudent approach here. Agreed. Well, this has been a very interesting discussion. It has gone to some areas where I did not expect it to go. 
pleasantly so. I'm continue to re I think we all continue to remain an optimist for AI and automation in medicine, thinking about the improvement of administrative process, augmentation of clinicians, reviewers, administrators, patients, and also automation of elements. I don't think we're going to be facing a terminator scenario anytime soon. And I think that we, there's a lot of work for us to do answering questions about helping the FDA uh, handle this space and continue to handle it. What we're going to do with payment, because right now it's the valley of death in terms of getting these products reimbursed either from payers, public or private, uh, or in a direct consumer setting. And then, of course, there are a lot of liability questions to be answered, parsing between clinician, hospital, software developer slash device manufacturer, or even the consumer. I still think that despite all these challenges I just enumerated, that there's a lot of positive potential to improve healthcare, and I look forward to watching it unfold over the next 20 to 30 years. And so thank you to all of you for joining us online and in person uh, here today at the American Enterprise Institute and looking forward to seeing you at our next event.